did what the new insights uh, were that, that arose from this uh, collaboration. So uh, as I say, uh, today though, I will try to be uh, pedagogical. There won't be uh, a lot of equations. And uh, well, I'll, I'll start by sort of showing you, um, you know, a, a moire pattern, which is uh, sort of what you get when you take um, two two-dimensional crystals um, let's say they are identical and you put them on top of each other and you rotate one against the other one. And what you then create is this uh, sort of superstructure where, uh, as you can see, there are some regions where sort of the, the lattices are directly on top of each other. And, and we'll talk of, typically about, uh, we call this an AA region. Uh, and then there are other regions where sort of the atoms in the bottom layer are sort of in the center of the hexagons of the top layer. And these are uh, called the A, B, or uh, the B, A regions. And this, uh, uh, what, what emerges is a new crystalline uh, structure, but of course with a much larger lattice constant than the original atomic lattice. Um, there are other ways of creating Moiré patterns. You could, for example, uh, put some one-dimensional polymers onto, onto a, a graphene crystal, and that creates a different kind of Moiré pattern. You can take two different 2D materials, so a hetero bilayer, for example, graphene and hexagonal boronitride, and put those on top of each other, and you will find a moiré pattern without a twist that just arises from the, the mismatch of the lattice constants. Right? So there's different ways of, of creating uh, these uh, moiré patterns. One of the sort of pleasing aspects of these materials is that they are, are rather beautiful. And in fact, uh, we collaborated with uh, the Royal Society of Sculptors at uh, a stand at the Great Exhibition Road Science Festival last year to sort of demonstrate the sort of interplay of scientific interest and, and, and beauty that these materials uh, have. So let me tell you a little bit about how experimentalists can make these uh, twisted bilayer materials. Uh, because actually, for, for many years, that was the bottleneck. So you could sort of get some twisted bilayer materials just by sort of uh, letting these uh, two-dimensional materials fall on top of each other, but the relative twist angle was sort of more or less arbitrary, and, and it wasn't very, very clear, clearly and very highly controllable. So, but, but that changed uh, with the uh, introduction of the so-called tear and stack technique. So let me try to explain that. So, so you start with a single monolayer of graphene that's on some uh, silicon or, or silicon oxide substrate. And then you bring down uh, this polymer stamp from the top. And at the front of this polymer stamp is a thin film of hexagonal boron nitride, which is sort of a preferred substrate for, uh, for, for graphene because it is truly atomically flat over large distances. Now, so you press down this stamp onto, onto the graphene, and then uh, by the van der Waals force, of course, the graphene will attach to the, to the boron nitride, and you can sort of retract the stamp again. And well, if you do that, at, at some point, you will rip the graphene into two pieces. So now you have, you know, one piece of graphene attached to your stamp, and another piece well, that's still on your, um, on your silicon or silicon oxide substrate. And the nice thing is that because these two pieces originate from the same graphene flake, they are perfectly aligned. And now, once you, once you have this sort of perfectly aligned starting point, you can uh, rotate mechanically uh, the substrate by uh, sort of a very precise amount. And then you just bring down uh, the top stamp with, with, the, with the top half of the, graph, of the graphene sheet down, and you have created your uh, a twisted bilayer. And, and so uh, they can sort of uh, achieve twist angle accuracies of sort of 0.1 degree or, or, or even better sometimes. So, so this is how you make it. And then um, what, what people typically do is they create some sort of a field effector a setup where sort of the, the twisted bilayer graphene is in the middle, you have uh, 
a, a sheet of hexagonal boron nitride on top. You have a sheet of hexagonal boron nitride on, on the bottom, so the, the twisted bilayer graphene is encapsulated. Uh, then you have a gate electrode that allows you to control the carrier density in, in the twisted bilayer graphene through the so-called electric field effect. And then, of course, you have a source and a drain electrode, which allow you to sort of control the current that goes through uh, your uh, twisted bilayer material. Now, what uh, was sort of uh, the big breakthrough in this field was when uh, Chow and uh, co-workers, so this was in the group in, in, uh, of Pablo Yurillo Herrero at MIT, when they made a sample with a twist angle of 1.1 degree, and well, we'll talk about what, what, why, what makes this 1.1 degree special, but, but it is special and that is why it's called the magic angle. So they were able with this tear and stack technique to create this magic angle twisted uh, uh, bilayer. And then they could measure uh, the transport properties of this system, right? And so here on the bottom, you see uh, the result. Uh, on the x-axis is the carrier density in, uh, in uh, well, uh, inverse centimeter squared. And on the y-axis is, is the conductance of this material. Now to understand this graph, I've also provided you with a band structure at, a, 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 at an angle that's quite close to 1.1 degree. And uh, well, we'll get to talking about uh, this band structure a, a little bit later. But the important thing is, that this band, that this is, it is a semi-metallic band structure. So the density of states at the Fermi level when, when, there's, when there are no additional carriers it is zero. And that is why uh, the conductance is low, All right? Now then if you, uh, so, this, so the band structure is very much like, like, like graphene, it's a semi-metal. So then when you add carriers, um, the, the density of states at the Fermi level increases and you get an increase in, um, in the conductance. Now, NS here denotes the total number of carriers that you have to add or subtract from the material so that you completely fill or empty out these, uh, this set of bands here, which is of course separated from the other bands by a small but finite gap. So when you, when you add precisely this number of electrons or you remove that number of electrons, what you create is, is a simple band insulator. And so again, if you have a band insulator, you expect the conductance to vanish. And that is exactly what they find at this density uh, that they denote by an S here on both sides. Uh, but then of course, th there's a surprise. And uh, the big surprise is when you tune the carrier density to precisely plus or minus half this value, so half the value, uh, of electrons that you need to completely fill or empty these bands, then you also uh, get a vanishing conductivity. And, um, and so this, uh, this vanishing of the conductivity, so this insulator state can obviously not be explained as a band structure effect. And that's why people call it a correlated insulator. Uh, sometimes you will hear the word mod insulator, but basically what it is, it is a, a beyond band structure effect and induced what that that's again an interpretation but most people is that this insulator state is induced by electron electron interactions okay so uh but then there, there are even more surprises uh when you cool down the sample and so here you see uh, the conductance at uh, something like one kelvin and you see at uh, at this whole doped uh uh uh, carrier density, where you, you used to have this correlated insulator state, all of a sudden you have a very high conductivity in the absence of a, of a magnetic field. And then if you apply a magnetic field, you recover your insulator state. And, and this is interpreted of uh, as sort of a, a signature of superconductivity. So you form Cooper pairs and these Cooper pairs are broken up by uh, a, 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 a magnetic field, which of course aligns the spin, which are anti-parallel in, in, in the Cooper pair. And so what you can then do is you can map out the phase diagram of this material as a function of carrier density, again on the x-axis here, and temperatures in Kelvin. Uh, 
And uh, what you see is this uh, correlated or mod insulator state in the middle. And then on both sides, uh, there are these uh, dome-like features where the conductance is high and uh, which are interpreted as uh, a superconductivity. And then above that, there's a standard metallic phase. And here on the right-hand side is the same measurement, a phase diagram uh, for a different sample. And you can see that there's, there's quite noticeable difference um, in, in these two different samples. And this is another uh, feature that is quite general, that uh, there are quite a few, uh, a lot of differences between different groups, different samples, which, which make this field a little uh, interesting and complicated. All right, um, now, if you look at, at this uh, temperature scale here, you think, well, I mean, here we are like 0.3 Kelvin, here we're like at one and a half Kelvin for the, for the highest uh, transition temperature, you could say, what do I care about a new superconductor with a, with a critical temperature of, of one Kelvin? Um, of course, you know, the, the, the high temperature uh, uh, cuprates are, you know, 100, 150 Kelvin. So, so maybe this is not a very interesting material. But it gets interesting when you take into account that the density of electrons in this material is extremely low. So you have essentially one Cooper pair on an area of about 100 square nanometers. And if you calculate the ratio of uh, the transition temperature to the Fermi temperature, you actually see that this material is in a similar class as uh, the Cooper's or uh, the nictites. So, so um, we, we think of this, uh, or, or the, the interpretation was that this points to a strong coupling, uh, electron-mediated superconductivity, uh, similar to what people believe to be happening in the cupras. And uh, to sort of fully explore the similarity to the cuprates, I'm putting here side by side the phase diagram of twisted bilayer graphene on the left, and uh, a cuprate superconductor on the right, and you see that they are quite similar. You have at zero doping uh, this anti well, you have a, an, an insulating parent phase. Uh, in the cuprates, we're quite sure that it's uh, antiferromagnetic, or, and uh, which is, has these superconducting domes on, on, on both sides. Now, of course, there are a lot of now, people have argued about the cuprates for, uh, for decades, ever, ever since the discovery, and uh, is, is, has, is, is probably still characterized as one of the big puzzles and the big questions of condensed matter physics to fully resolve and explain this phase diagram. So a lot of people were, got, got very excited when they, when they saw this sort of similarity because, uh, well, twisted bilayer graphene has a couple of advantages over the cuprates. Well, one advantage is graphene is, is a clean material, so you can make fairly big flakes of graphene with, with barely any defects, while the cuprates tend to, be, tend to have a lot of defects, in particular when you dope them, because the way you dope the cuprates is through chemical group doping. So you substitute some of the atoms by, by some foreign types of atoms, which sort of is, is quite a complicated process, while sort of this electric field doping in, in, in twisted bilayer graphene is much, much easier, and you can sort of map out this whole phase diagram with a single sample, while for the cuprates you need many samples, each with a different chemical composition. So there was a lot of hope initially that we could learn from the twisted bilayer uh, graphene and, 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 and understand some of the questions uh, about these uh, cuprate materials. So may I interject a question here? Of um, course. You um, mentioned that the uh, conductivity in these uh, regions that are labeled superconductors is somewhat enhanced. Um, but so usually for superconductors, we're uh, used to seeing resistivities actually go to zero. So, I mean, to which extent can we actually know the inherent resistivity of this uh, flake? I mean, uh, you know, the, in, clearly the uh, conductivity here doesn't become extremely large, right? It just becomes larger. So uh, to which extent is that an inherent feature of, say, 2D superconductors that they maybe have some residual resistance or is it just a problem with the experimental setup? 
This is a very good question. Um, so I'm, I'm not necessarily, I wouldn't call my character as myself as a superconductivity expert, but of course, what, what, I, what I do know is that superconductivity in 2D is, is, is a tricky business, right? And I think uh, also in the corporates, you need, I think, the third dimension to, to sort of st stabilize a bulk thermodynamic phase. And, and there's issues around things like, like the Merman Wagner theorem. So, you know, superconductivity is, is, is quite, uh, sensitive to um, in, in, in these materials and uh, there's a lot of discussion among experimentalists what how to sort of truly characterize uh, a, a super a superconductor in, 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 in 2D and uh, I know that some of these papers on the twisted TMDs for example are, are held up at, <laughs> at the reviewing stage because people are arguing you know can you be sure that it's truly a superconductor so, so the test that, uh, that uh, people like uh, Dmitry Efetov told me is the ultimate test is with, whether you can see a sort of this, this uh, a, a, what they call a Fraunhofer pattern if you create a Josephson, Josephson junction. So you have to create a Josephson junction and then study, study that and that, that gives you some, some insights whether it's a truly, truly a superconductor. But I mean, you, you're, you're asking a good question and this is something that people argue about a lot in this field. How can you be sure it's truly a superconductor? Mm -hmm. There was a follow-up question in the chat as to whether there were magnetic susceptibility measurements and what they could tell us. Um, um, uh, you, magnetic susceptibility, um, I, I, that's a good question. I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't recall. Um, it's, it's not. I'm not so much in, into the superconductivity bit of 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 of, of these materials. So, so probably I'm the wrong person to ask the most detailed questions. Uh, so I, I I can't really answer that question very very well. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, right. Um, Should I continue, or is there more yeah, questions? I, I was just wondering. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so some follow-up questions, just trying to see if, if we actually need to ask them. But yeah, so is that why you said that these phases were interpreted as superconductivity rather than saying that they are superconductivity, right? I mean, well, I'm trying to be as careful in, in my choice of words, not to sort of, you know, I mean, all, everything is an interpretation, but uh, with these, here superconductivity, you have to be extremely careful. And uh, there, as, as I said, were people were initially thought they had seen superconductivity in some of these materials. Basically, there, there's now a growing a consensus that they're in fact non-superconducting. So it is, it, is diff, it is sort of a very sensitive business to say with full, with full confidence, this is a superconductor. But for twisted bilayer graphene, I think there is a pretty much agreement that, that it is a superconductor because of these uh, Josephson junction effects. Okay, okay. yeah. I think uh, we can probably go on, let you go on that. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll actually go on. Um, all right. So uh, where were I? Okay. So, so this, this was sort of uh, the, the first phase diagram that came out of, out of MIT. And then at last year's uh, 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 Hubbard workshop, um, Dimitri Efetov presented uh, these phase diagrams in, in his group uh, that, that came out of his group in Barcelona, where uh, there's much more going on uh, than in the MIT phase diagrams. In particular, they see many more correlated insulator states. So CS denotes correlated insulator states and BI is the band insulator. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, sometimes they see them more pronounced. Sometimes you have to, <laughs> sometimes he has to draw some dashed lines to make people see the, the, the correlated insulator states. And, uh, and other groups, uh, like the Columbia group, see, see some correlated insulator states where Efetov didn't see them. But uh, basically the point is, at, at all integer fillings, um, you, you, you tend to see uh, correlated insulator states. So what that means is that um, there are two conduction bands and two valence bands in this material. Each one can accommodate two electrons. So you can either add or subtract two electrons from the flat bands. And basically what they find is when they add one electron, you get a correlated insulator state. You add two electrons, you get another one. You add three electrons, you get a third correlated insulator state. And if you add the fourth one, you're at the band insulator. And then in between these correlated insulator states are 
uh, various superconducting domes. So, um, so a very intriguing phase diagram, and it's it's an interesting story how, how, what, where this difference comes from, where this difference comes from, and uh, what what Efetov, uh, argues is that he has better samples because what he does is uh, when you when you when you do this tear and stack technique and you sort of put down the graphene that's on top of your stamp onto the substrate again, what you can create are air bubbles. So you can see that there are some bubbles in the graphene. And uh, well, he basically pushed on these air bubbles and squeezed out the air. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that gives you this, uh, that gives you a cleaner sample and uh, you know, more electronic phases. So, so sometimes, you know, experimental science is very, uh, you know, hands-on in, in, this, in this respect. Um, okay, so this was all, all I said so far was about uh, twisted bilayer graphene, but of course, you know, there, there's a whole zoo of two-dimensional materials out. In fact, a recent uh, a study by Nicola Mazzari uh, predicted there are several thousand exfoliable materials. And uh, well, you have these, you have this potential pool of several thousand two-dimensional materials and out of this pool, you can create an even bigger pool of twisted bilayer materials. And uh, you can study what, what happens if you, if you twist them. Now, uh, people have started to, to, to play these kind of games. And uh, here I'm showing you results from, from the Columbia group of uh, Corridin and, and, and Pasupati where they created uh, a twisted uh, bilayer of tungsten diselenide. So the, the transition metal dichalcogenides are of course, uh, well, many of them are uh, two-dimensional uh, semiconductors with band gaps on, on, the, on the order of one, two electron volts. So you, you expect very different physics than in, in graphene, which is a semi-metal and for example, interesting optical effects. Uh, but what they did is they uh, whole doped this material and measured again the conductance. And what they find is when they uh, half fill the valence band with holes, again, they find an, an, an insulator state where they wouldn't expect one based on a band structure picture. So you also see these uh, strong electron correlations in, in this new class of materials. And uh, sort of this is just starting to, to grow and become very, uh, a very big field. So I, I will not say very much about these uh, twisted TMDs, but uh, I, I, I'll come back to them uh, at, at the end of the talk. Just have one more question, if we can take that. Um, yeah, go ahead. On the chat. So Sonia Haddad asks, in the effort of phase diagram, do all the superconducting states have the same symmetry of their order parameters? That's a good question. Uh, well, they don't really measure the symmetry of the order parameter. That's obviously what, what everybody would love to know. Uh, what what these phases are, and uh, so these are just transport experiments. Um, so um, so they they don't unfortunately they don't learn very much about about you know the properties of these um, of these phases. So um, I think the answer is I, I don't uh, they don't nobody knows really at this point. So some of these correlated insulator states, though, I mean, uh, I mean, people know that they have uh, different uh, properties. So sometimes they see sort of topological properties. Sometimes they see magnetic properties. So for the correlated phases, correlated insulator states, it's, it's quite well established that they're not all the same. And this suggests, obviously, that all these superconducting domes might not be the same. But then again, they might. I mean, I, I, to, uh, on my talk on Wednesday, I will show you sort of uh, some some evidence that uh, there might not be such a strong um, um, uh, there might be only a weak interplay between superconductivity and correlated insulated states. Uh, that means that their that their fundamental origin might might be quite different. But but we'll get to that on Wednesday. It's a good question. Okay, I shall continue. So, okay, so, so what are then the questions that a theorist might ask of herself or himself? Um, what, 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 what would be useful to do from a theory perspective? So, of course, we could help. I mean, the, the, the ultimate goal would be to answer the question, what is the you know, microscopic mechanism of the correlated insulator state? Uh, 
And similarly, what, what is the microscopic mechanism, for example? What, what is the pairing glue? What are the order parameters of the superconducting states? And uh, well, the good news is basically every possible uh, 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 explanation that is known to mankind has already been proposed. So somebody's got to be right. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously, we, we would like to be sure. And uh, then more related to experiment is how do these states then depend on twist angle doping, temperature, uh, pressure, so external stimuli that would then allow us to probe these phases and, and sort of make predictions that are, that are verifiable in, in experiment. Um, but as, as Gunnar alluded in the beginning, uh, answering this question is uh, challenging because these materials feature uh, a, a rather unconventional combination of, of, of difficulties. So the one uh, difficulty is uh, you have to deal with strong correlations, but there's a big field of condensed matter physics that, that deals with strongly correlated materials. But the other problem is to deal with large supercells. So for example, if we want to understand the properties of twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle, you have to deal with more than 10,000 carbon atoms in, in your supercell. And it is precisely this combination of challenges that sort of you know, makes it interesting, but, but also difficult to, to really uh, understand what's going on in this material. So, and, and I will try to sort of tell you a little bit about, uh, well, our, our attempts to, to, you know, combine these challenges and, uh, and, and learn something. Uh, but before I, I, so I'll first talk about sort of standard techniques to, to deal with strong correlations in the materials that we know. So here, for example, I'm showing you a couple of different uh, uh, instances of the cuprate materials. And, um, well, I mean, these are also complicated material. They're, they're, you know, you see many different uh, atoms and uh, it gets even more complicated if you, if you add some uh, substitutional dopants. Um, but, but sort of this is uh, sort of what, what, what people have dealt with over the past uh, decades. So how, how can we understand this material? And sort of the, the idea is to, to simplify uh, this complex material and sort of distill its essence, you could say. Uh, and the essence, uh, people believe, is sort of in, the, in these uh, copper oxygen planes. And in particular, uh, it is uh, the d orbitals on, on, on the copper atoms, which form a, a cubic uh, two-dimensional, uh, so a, a two-dimensional square lattice. And you see this is sort of these copper oxygen planes are uh, present in, in all these different uh, cuprate materials. And uh, so, the hope is that we can sort of cook up a relatively simple model Hamiltonian um, that describes all of these different materials at the same time. And uh, of course, this leads us to uh, the work of uh, John Hubbard himself, uh, after which this consortium is named, who was the first to write down this Hamiltonian, where you have sort of one term. Uh, the first term is a hopping term, where you sort of, the electrons hop, from uh, the orbitals of one copper atom to the orbitals of, of a neighbor. And uh, the strength of this hopping is described by T. And then there is a second term that describes the effect of electron-electron interaction, uh, which is, uh, and the corresponding parameter is this, this Hubbard U. And so this Hamiltonian is, of course, we have to appreciate is, is, a, is a big idealization of these true materials. It is boiled down to a very few degrees of freedom um, and of course, the other problem is it contains adjustable parameters. And we have to think about ways of, of, of determining what these parameters are if we want to describe, answer a question about a specific cuprate like YBCO. But the, the immediate task at hand is uh, we have to diagonalize, we have to, we have to solve the Hamiltonian to calculate observ observables. Now, now, there is a wide range of methods available, and uh, I'm no expert in, in strongly correlated materials. Uh, the method I have picked out is, is dynamical mean field theory, uh, partially because it, among all these other strong correlation methods, dynamical mean field theory has come the longest way in becoming a material-specific theory. And there's many implementations uh, 
uh, where you can sort of use DMFT to answer a specific material and, and not just uh, a Hubbard Hamiltonian. Now, now DMFT is, is a, a very beautiful theory. It's, 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 uh, it's very physics-y in some sense because it is based on the observation, I think first made by, uh, by Dieter Vollhardt, that the self energy, which relates uh, the interacting to the non-interacting Green's function, and then from the Green's function, of course, you can extract observables. So the self energy, which you know, captures the effect of electron-electron interactions is a local quantity in infinite dimension. So if you have an, uh, sort of an infinite dimensional material, so not two-dimensional, three-dimensional, but infinite dimensional, then you can rigorously show that the self energy is local, and that means independent of, of, of uh, uh, crystal momentum. And, uh, and this insight can then be exploited because it allows us to map uh, a crystal, an atom in a crystal onto uh, an atom interacting with a bath of non-interacting electrons. So this is uh, the famous Anderson impurity model. And for the Anderson impurity model, we have uh, very good ways of solving this, for example, with, with quantum Monte Carlo. So it's, it's a very elegant theory, uh, dynamical mean field theory. And, uh, and uh, well, it, it, it sort of allows to, to solve the Hubbard model uh, quite accurately. Uh, but now we want to sort of not solve the Hubbard model, you know, in itself, we want to understand real materials. And this then raises the question, how do you parameterize a Hamiltonian? How do you determine the T and the U and the Hubbard Hamiltonian? And of course, the other problem is, um, the other problem is, um, you know, the cuprates are a three-dimensional or the copper oxygen planes are two-dimensional objects, so they're not infinite dimensional. So the simplification uh, on, onto which uh, DMFT is built might no longer be justified, and, and this is typically solved by, by going to cluster DMFT. Um, but the, the, the main problem that I want to talk about is how to determine these uh, parameters that go into the Hubbard model. And, and this brings us to density functional theory, which is basically uh, a, the theory that allows us to model materials without any empirical parameters. and uh, you could say, uh, well, I mean, some people argue that it is <laughs> the most impactful theory that, that was ever created in the physical sciences. And that is largely based on the observation that <laughs> among the, the top sided papers are, I guess, mostly DFT papers. So I guess, uh, you know, Barding, Cooper, Schrieffer is something like the, the 20th highly, most highly cited papers. And uh, the, um, the, the paper that, that describes the generalized gradient exchange correlation functional is, I don't know, maybe the top, the, th the third, third most cited paper. But anyway, so density functional theory is a theory that very accurately calculates the ground state energy of a material. And from the ground state energy, you can deduce a lot of uh, important quantities like, you know, structural properties, forces, you can calculate phonons, uh, you can calculate phase diagrams. So, so a lot of very practical questions you can answer uh, with density functional theory. And the equation that you solve is shown here. It's, it's a very simple one particle equation called the Cohen-Sham equation, where you have sort of a kinetic energy term. You have the potential from the ionic nuclei, just you know, minus Z over R. Then you have the Hartree potential. This is just basically what you get from, from a classical electrostatic a treatment of the electrons and then all sort of these interesting quantum mechanical exchange and correlation effects are sort of packed into this last term and this last term has to be approximated but sort of the good news is that even the simplest approximations uh, such as the very uh, widely used local density approximation work quite well for, for, for a very broad class of materials and so I'm just showing you here um, the calculated lattice constant of these uh, 20 different materials uh, on the x-axis experiments, on the y-axis theory, and you see the DFT lies basically perfectly on the diagonal. And, uh, and uh, sort of, you know, this is achieved without tuning any parameters. So, so it's, 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 it's a big success of, of, of theoretical uh, material science. And uh, quite deservedly, uh, Walter Cohen, who uh, 
uh, sort of first invented this theory uh, was awarded with, with the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry though. All right, so how can, we, how can we then marry these two worlds? One, the first principles world, lots of degrees of freedom, uh, but you know, approximate treatments of, ex of, of electron electron interactions with this model Hamiltonian world with few degrees of freedom and very accurate treatments of electron electron interactions. And the connection is uh, through Wanye functions. So the uh, Hubbard Hamiltonian is written down in a real space language, while of course uh, the solutions of uh, the Cohn Sham equations are Bloch waves. And uh, you know, going from a localized to a delocalized quantity can be achieved essentially uh, via a Fourier transform. And this is what gives us these localized uh, one-year orbitals, which can then serve as a basis uh, for the Hubbard Hamiltonian. Now, these one-year functions are tricky objects. And, uh, and uh, I think that this is sort of one of the things that most frequently is sort of swept under the rug, that it's quite hard to generate them it is well known that there is no, there's no unique choice for the one-year functions. There's different procedures, like for example, uh, maximal, uh, maximally localized one-year functions, but then other people use sort of symmetry, uh, introduce symmetry constraints and sort of sacrifice some of the uh, localizations to sort of enforce certain properties they desire. Uh, it's very hard to calculate them numerically because they're very sensitive on the starting point there's a lot of problems with these one-year functions that very rarely you hear, uh, uh, they, they are discussed. Uh, here on the bottom, I'm showing you the, the results uh, for uh, a, a nickel oxide, which is another uh, strongly correlated transition metal oxide. And you see sort of some of these one-year functions look like S orbitals, other look P-like, and other look like uh, various D orbitals. But you know, there's always some, some sort of little extra features um, that, make them different from just purely atomic orbitals. But, but you know, there are sort of established codes that allow you to create these one-year functions. And once you have them, you can create, you can calculate the T and the U that go into the Hubbard Hamiltonian, for example, you can get the T from a matrix element of your DFT Hamiltonian, and you can get the U by sort of a matrix element of your uh, interaction. Now, there's another set of problems associated with that procedure. Well, the one problem is that the DFT Hamiltonian, of course, already includes some mean field description of electron-electron interactions. And you have to sort of subtract that out if you want to sort of put it back in uh, into the U. So there is uh, dangers associated with double counting electron-electron interactions. Uh, and of course, then there's the question of the choice of, of, of W, the fundamental interaction. Well, of course, you could, you could say the fundamental interaction is Coulomb, one over R, but really because you're throwing away uh, so many degrees of freedom in this model Hamiltonian, you should argue that these degrees of freedom, these high energy degrees of freedom that you have thrown out, renormalize your, your interaction. And uh, so you might argue that you shouldn't use the, the bare Coulomb interaction, but, but something more complicated, a screened interaction. Actually, Hannes, we have a question here from Fernando yeah. Lata. If he just wants to go ahead and ask that in. Fernando, can you unmute yourself? Um... Okay, seems to have gone. Maybe we can take it a bit later then. Um... Okay, sure. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll stick around. Uh, anyway, so, um, so what about these screen interactions? You, there's sort of systematic ways of calculating them. So you could say your bare Coulomb interaction should be divided by some sort of dielectric constant. And this dielectric constant is obtained from some polarizability P. And the polarizability you could calculate in first order perturbation theory gives you this expression. So you express the polarizability as a sum of transitions from occupied to unoccupied state. And you see, if you want to, want to evaluate this expression for a general material, it's, it's quite challenging. Um, but basically what, what, what people often do is they uh, exclude from these transitions the ones that are contained within the active subspace. So the ones that you have actually, the, the correlated degrees of freedom. And what you then get is often called the constraint uh, random phase approximation. So, so this is what's typically used. But then again, there is a discussion about how accurate that, that actually is. Uh, 
Um, so that also has to be taken with, with a grain of salt. Anyway, so you see, uh, modeling, material specific modeling of strongly correlated materials is a difficult business. There's a, a lot of subtleties, but there's also some rewards, and which is of course the reason why people do it. So here I'm, I'm showing you um, a comparison of uh, experiment versus uh, DMFT and then GW, which you could think of as an improved version of, of, of density functional theory for strontium vanadate, which is another archetypical example of a correlated, uh, of an in, a correlated material. And what you see is that this sort of mean field picture, GW or, or DFT, well, there's certainly quite significant differences between uh, the photo emission result uh, and, 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 and uh, GW, for example, you completely missed the second peak. Um, and uh, well, if you then do uh, the DMFT on top of the uh, first principles method, well, you get a sort of a definite improvement. And uh, well, and, and so, so there is a reason to, be, to, to go through this difficulty of um, combining first principles methods and uh, strongly correlated techniques. All right, so, so this is sort of the standard picture of you know, modeling strongly correlated materials. But uh, well, so now let's come back to uh, the question at hand, uh, Moiré materials and see if we can apply uh, this uh, framework, this established framework also for this material. And it, and it fails very quickly. And the reason is that it's very hard to do a DFT calculation for such a big uh, unit cell. So, um, you know, you can do a DFT calculation for a couple of hundred atoms relatively comfortably. It gets quite uncomfortable when you want to do a thousand or a few thousand, but when it gets to 10,000, it gets really uncomfortable. And so, it's, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's, you, you need sort of the biggest supercomputer you can get and uh, very few people well, have access to, to these things. So, um, so how do we model these? How do we model the electronic structure of these materials? Uh, but before we get to the electronic structure, we also have to think about the atomic structure, which uh, is, which, which is not non-trivial in these materials. And uh, uh, the problem is, uh, that you have these sort of regions of AA stacking and of AB stacking in this material. And it's very well known that the interlayer separation of AA stacked bilayer graphene and AB stacked uh, bilayer graphene is different by something like 10-15%. Uh, and of course, the reason is just a steric repulsion. If you have AA stacking, then you know, the atoms can, cannot come too close, uh, close to each other. So if you create this Moiré pattern, you will have regions of AA stacking where the atoms are more, more separated from each other and region, regions of AB stacking where they're closer. And this gives you this kind of undulating uh, corrugated shape uh, of these materials. And of course, this corrugation then is very important because it determines essentially how easy it is in certain regions for the electrons to jump from one layer to the other layer. So you can't discuss the electronic structure without the atomic structure but how do you calculate the atomic structure in the first place? And uh, so what people mostly do uh, is to use some sort of classical force field approach. So they uh, use sort of non, they, they, count, they use forces between atoms that are not quantum mechanical, but, but classical. And there are various expressions like, you know, Erebo and uh, kolmogorov Crespi, which sort of capture both Van der Waals interaction, but also steric effects and things like that. So, so this is also what, what we are using these force field methods to get uh, insights into the atomic structure. But then very recently people have done uh, some DFT calculations on these very big systems and, and, and found actually some, some differences. So there's currently a lot of questions about the reliable, reliability of these force fields. Um, okay, but, but once you have sort of settled on a structure, uh, on an atomic structure, you can start asking about the electronic structure which again is very hard to calculate. And sort of what people do most frequently is to use uh, tight binding, which of course means you switch off the interaction between electrons. Uh, there's different flavors of tight binding. One is the sort of the, the most popular is the so-called empirical tight binding, which is based on these slater costa rules. So of course the important orbitals on the carbon atoms are the PZ orbitals, and these can either be 
sort of aligned back to back, which is if you have two atoms in different uh, bilayers, or they can be side to side when the two atoms are on the same bilayer. And depending on this uh, relative arrangement, you can have different uh, uh, hopping uh, integrals, which are denoted by dpp sigma and dpp pi. And uh, so using these slater coster rules, you can sort of construct uh, hopping Hamiltonians for you know, arbitrary atomic structures. Uh, but again, what you introduce is you introduce some parameters. So here, uh, VPP pi, VPP sigma are written in terms of these exponentials and there are some uh, parameters, gamma zero, gamma one, a, zero, a and a one, and you somehow need, need to determine these parameters. Uh, so what's typically done is you compare your, um, you do the biggest DFT calculation you can, maybe, maybe this is a twist angle of five degree, and well, you try to uh, play with these parameters uh, in the tight binding until you sort of match the DFT. And so here I'm showing you sort of the red curve is, uh, uh, the red dots are a DFT for a twisted bilayer and uh, the red line is, is tight binding. You see, you can, you, guess that you can get them to match reasonably well. For, for twisted bilayer graphene. All right, and then you can, once you have sort of some, some trust in your tight binding model, you can apply it to smaller twist angles or bigger supercells. And here, these are results from, from, from my group where we've calculated the band structure from tight binding as a function of twist angle. Many, many groups have done the same. And what you see here is you always get this sort of semi-metallic uh, band structure. Uh, but as you sort of, as the twist angle decreases, you see the width of these flat bands becomes smaller and smaller. And then if you're sort of at 1.2 degree, you see the, the width of these flat bands is really, is only a couple of milli electron volts. And uh, well, and then if you go even lower with the twist angle, it, it opens up again. So what you have here is really, uh, this, this is what's uh, known as the magic angle that was originally predicted by, uh, uh, McDonald and, and Bistritzer, um, something like 10 years ago. And what this means is, of course, that at the magic angle, you have flat bands, and that means your band velocity uh, vanishes, and that means electrons have little or almost no kinetic energy. And as a consequence, of course, electron electron interactions become important. And this is, of course, the reason why we get uh, these correlated insulator states in the first place. Uh, so he can ask a question here. Oh, sorry, Gunnar, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Um, just on the fact of the magic angle, right? Um, I mean, I think it's really a sequence of several magic angles that is in principle possible, right? Can you actually uh, verify this uh, with, your, uh, with your modeling uh, or do you just see one of these? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, we, we, yes, we can, we can modify it. I mean, the tight binding at some point gets also quite expensive. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't know if we've ever tried to find the second magic angle just because most of the interest is in the first one. Uh, but I, I think we should find it. I mean, I, I haven't tried it yet. So it's, it's actually a good question. We should, we should try to find it. But, but there, there should be more magic angles. Yes. Sam said there was another question. Was that from you, Sam? Or? Yes, from me. All right. Go ahead. No, I, I just, sorry, I can't raise my hand as a co-host. Um, uh, the question is, when you plot um, pictures like this with the unit cell, is this the original unit cell or is it the very large supercell? And right. similarly, when you come up with tight binding models, are you making a tight binding model that varies over the entire supercell or are you somehow averaging it out into a much smaller effective model? No, no. I mean, what we're doing is we're solving, I mean, uh, there, there's one orbital per carbon atom. So if you have 10,000 carbon atoms in your unit cell, we're solving a 10,000 by 10,000 uh, Hamiltonian. But, you know, you can do that pretty routinely on, on, on if you have a big enough computer. Um, so so uh, regarding your, uh, your the, the labeling on, on the x-axis is you're absolutely right. I mean, as I go to bigger supercells, my, uh, you, my Brion zone shrinks, uh, but it always stays hexagonal. So we can always use this k gamma mk prime to label the special points in the Brion zone, but the, the size, the overall size of the Brion zone is different in each picture. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay, so the k point is actually just a very different wave vector in each different picture at each different angle because it depends on the size of the supercell. Exactly, 
Okay, sure. Right, so we have yeah. another question in the chat. Actually. Yeah, just, just to f final comment, it's just remarkable how similar they look, um, given that you've changed the size of the super, given that they're just very different scales compared to the original graphene. I mean, I just always find that curious. Maybe there's some reason for it, but. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. It's okay, a good Yes, you might also get to these other questions. So here's one from Chun Li Huang who asks, what is the nature of the magic angle? Is it due to some sort of destructive interference? Right, so the hand wavy explanation that, that experimentalists give when, when you read the nature paper by Yarilo Herrero is at the magic angle, there is um, uh, a two, en two energy scales become equal. The one energy scale is you can ask yourself, so, so there are, there, you get, I mean, think, uh, think about decoupling the two graphene sheets for a second, right? And then rotating one with respect to the other. And now you can ask the question, what is the energy barrier going from sort of the Dirac point of one graphene sheet to the Dirac point on, of the other graphene sheet, right? So this activation barrier uh, is sort of a quantity that depends on, on the twist angle because it depends on how much you have rotated one Dirac cone from the other one. And then there's another energy scale, and that is just the, the magnitude of the interlayer hopping. So, um, so when these two energy scales become equal, that actually gives you a fairly good estimate of the magic angle, but it doesn't explain why there's more than one. And in fact, if you ask, I guess we had that same discussion last year with Alan McDonald, and his answer essentially was it's, it's complicated. <laughs> the, these hand wavy arguments are, 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 are quite limited in their predictive power. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, and here's just another picture of, of the bandwidth as a function of, of twist angle. So um, let me also for completeness, even though I, it's, it's not my, the, a tool I use, a lot of, a lot of people uh, are fond of this continuum model, uh, which is essentially we know for, for graphene, we can sort of take, start with a tight binding and derive an effective mass model. And this effective mass model is just the Dirac equation on the top here. And McDonald and Bistrix are essentially derived the same effective mass theory for the twisted bilayer, where they, of course, had to consider the interlayer hopping. But when you do that, you get a very elegant and, and of course, much numerically easier theory than, um, than, uh, than the tight bindings. You only have um, like a, something like an 8 by 8 or 10 by 10 ma matrix, depending on how many bands you want to include. And you also learn a couple of things. So for example, you get a separate, you, you, you get insight, namely that sort of the, the two um, uh, K points of the original graphene layer decouple in the twisted bilayer. And so you get uh, a, a sort of a, a valley quantum number uh, in the band structure. So you see these red, red bands and these black bands, which are completely separated in, 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 in the continuum model. But of course you wouldn't see this kind of emergent uh, uh, prop behavior if you just did a tight binding. So, um, okay, and then, uh, so I still want to sort of also glimpse at these other uh, moiré materials like these twisted bilayers, which are of course chemically much more complicated than graphene. And so what people have done is they have, you know, done, tried to do the biggest DFT calculations they could. And what they found was that these twisted TMDs, so I think this is molybdenum disulfide, at a twist angle of three and a half degree, they also exhibit flat valence bands, which of course uh, sort of uh, can then explain why you see also these correlated insulator states in the experiments that I've uh, shown you previously. Um, now to go to bigger twist angles, you might try to also develop a tight binding model, but uh, that gets quite, quite complicated quite quickly. So even if you, only, if you only want to retain the 5D orbitals on the molybdenum and, uh, well, 3P orbitals on both of the sulfur atoms, it gives you uh, 11 orbitals per uh, chemical formula unit. And uh, there's many possible hoppings. So here you see a list of these hoppings. If you go to sort of nearest neighbor hopping, you're easily at something like 40, 50 parameters. So, uh, well, uh, and then of course you need a recipe for, for get putting numbers on all of these parameters, which of course you can do by sort of using this uh, wanderization procedure, which uh, has been done by uh, Tim Cuxiras in Harvard, uh, at least for the untwisted bilayer. And here you see uh, 
glue DFT and, and, and red type binding and you see, well, you can get them, get them to match reasonably well. Um, so, so there's also, um, you know, hopes of developing type binding models for these uh, more complicated twisted TNDs. So, but then the key ingredient of going from sort of the material specific methods to the strong correlation method are, are Wanier functions as, as I previously described. And uh, so uh, if you try to generate these Wanier functions, uh, what you'll find is that uh, the centers in order to sort of uh, get the right symmetry of the band structures, the centers of these Wanier functions have to sit on the AB positions of the Moore array pattern. And now this, if you look at these AB positions and you connect them, what you get of course is, is, is a honeycomb uh, a lattice. So what you get, uh, the emergent, uh, is you get something that looks a lot like a graphene lattice at the Moore array scale. And this is precisely the reason, uh, I guess it was, it was Sam who asked this question, why the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene is so similar to graphene because these Moore array, uh, these one year functions sit on um, an emergent lattice that is a sort of a, a hexagonal graphene lattice. Now, if we look at these one year functions, so uh, they, are, they are centered on the AB regions, but interestingly, uh, they consist of three lobes. So this is one one year function here. This is another one year function over there. So each one year function consists of three lobes and the center of these lobes are actually on the AA regions. So it has a very special structure that of course has nothing to do with any sort of atomic one year functions that we might be used to seeing from, you know, standard strongly correlated materials. And of course, the one year function is extended over the whole Moira unit cell. So these are not atomic orbitals. These are orbitals with an extent of, you know, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers. By the way, I should uh, just to come, sort of coming towards the end of the hour and we then have an extra 15 minutes, which could be either talk or questions. Yeah, so I'm, I think I'm only a couple more minutes. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine and, and only need five more minutes. That's okay. Perfect. No worries. Um, right. And then, of course, once you have the one year function and you're tight binding Hamiltonian, you can try to, you know, generate a hopping model. But of course, not an atomistic hopping model, but you know, a, a Moire scale hopping model. Uh, but again, these hopping models are quite complicated. So here you see sort of how the hopping parameters depend on distance from the center. And here you see a comparison how, you know, how many, how, how, how long range hoppings you have to take into account to reproduce the full atomistic band structure of these materials. So, so it, it, is, it is quite, quite complicated. Uh, and then, of course, so now we have our, our, our hopping part of the Hamiltonian, of our Moiré, of our model Hamiltonian. Next, we need the interactions. And uh, as I previously alluded, we can use, again, the Wanier functions to calculate our uh, Hubbard parameters. Uh, but we have to make a choice for the interaction. And, uh, well, the most naive choice would be to use a Coulomb interaction, uh, possibly divided by some dielectric constant. And if you do that and calculate uh, these Hubbard parameters as a function of the distance between the one year functions, well, not surprisingly, you get some very long range uh, Hubbard parameters, which of course is different from the original Hubbard Hamiltonian, which only used on site interactions. Um, you can also add other types of contributions to the Hamiltonian. So you could say, you know, what about exchange interactions in addition to one uh, to the Hubbard terms? And uh, well, here in the top row, this is work by Cushino. On the top row, you see the Hubbard parameters, and in the bottom row, you see the exchange parameters as function of distance. And uh, well, I mean, they're smaller, but and they decay quickly, but you know, they're they're not negligible. And uh, well, you can keep playing that game. So maybe there's yet other types of Coulomb interactions that are important. And so uh, uh, this is the work of, of Paco Guinea, who basically proposed that it's a special type of uh, Coulomb interaction, what he calls an electron assisted hopping that actually plays a key role in this material. 
And uh, so, so the first term is the standard Hubbard term. And the second one is basically where you have an on-site term. So you have I prime and I prime here. And this is an on-site term that changes a hopping term, right? So here you have a C, I, C, J. So, so this is what he calls an electron assisted uh, hopping, uh, which is a special type of, you know, Coulomb interaction matrix element. And uh, he has shown that, that this specific type of, 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 of uh, matrix element can actually lead to superconductivity. So you have to be very careful in, in you know, the things that you throw away from, from your Hamiltonian because, well, if you don't have a very strong intuition about the material, you might lose you know, some of the key physics. Um, I think I will skip these last two slides because um, this will, I, I can easily put those into, into my uh, talk on Friday. So this is about the choice of the interaction. Do you have to go beyond sort of a standard Coulomb interaction? And I, I will just conclude uh, with a summary. So I hope I've shown you that uh, there's some value in trying to develop unbiased Hamiltonian if you want to achieve an unbiased understanding of these new Moiré materials. One of the most common fallacies is, you know, if you, if you sort of say this material behaves like cuprates, more likely than not is if you study this material, you'll find out that it's a cuprate, right? So we're very easily biased. Um, but then I've also shown you that constructing these unbiased Hamiltonian for Moiré materials is, is quite difficult because we can't just use our standard techniques um, that we have in place for, you know, correlated materials like the cuprates or the transition metal oxides. But, you know, we can, we can, we can and we have developed some, some new tools to, to sort of get there. But then there's also a more uh, broader question is, should we try to copy and paste essentially? Should we try to, to recreate these models uh, for, um, uh, should, we, should we use exactly the same approaches, basically downfolding and strong, strong correlation methods to understand these Moiré materials? Or should we in fact start from scratch and really think about new strong correlation techniques maybe techniques that don't require a thinning out of some degrees of freedom and let us treat and understand the properties of, you know, 10,000 atom unit cells. Uh, so that was all. Thank, thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thanks very much for that great talk. Yeah, so let's thank you. Uh, a round of applause. Um, there are some questions popping up in the chat already. So, Chun Li, do you, do you just want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask that yourself, maybe? Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you for the talk. So, I just want to ask uh, how can real space type binding model help to understand topological H states in more rare materials? As you probably know, recently they have seen quantum anomalous Hall effect, and, and, and I was wondering can real space uh, type binding help to illustrate the nature of these H states? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I think I think these um, well, I mean, topological insulators are, are uh, many of these topological insulators are studied with uh, hopping models like uh, type binding DFT. Um, you know, if you look at sort of the work by Kane and Millay on, on on graphene, those were essentially type binding models to to understand uh, topological properties. Um, so yeah, I mean, but you have a uh, ten thousand atoms in a unit cell. So how do you construct an H? Well, I mean, that, that is quite straightforward, right? I mean, it's, I mean, uh, as, as, as long as you can die, I mean, your, your, hop, your, your type binding Hamiltonian is basically as big as the number of units uh, of orbitals in your unit cell. So the only thing you have to do is you have to be able to diagonalize a 10,000 by 10,000 Hamiltonian, but you can probably do that on your laptop. Thank you. Okay, our next question is from Yiping Huang. Uh, Yiping, do you want to go ahead as well and ask the question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the uh, nice talk. I have a question about the uh, comparison between experiments and the DFT uh, results. Are there some kind of like optical or RPS type of thing that can help you to identify the parameters? Yes, uh, so I'll get to that on, on Wednesday. We'll, we'll talk a lot about uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy. And uh, so STM is a very useful tool for these, uh, for these systems where you sort of come, come in with a sharp tip and, and measure uh, 
sort of how easy it is for an electron to hop into the twisted bilayer material. So uh, ARP has, has been done, but <laughs> actually uh, the band is so flat that you can't resolve the dispersion of the flat band with ARPES. So they see just a dot. <laughs> I see. Uh, but STM is very useful. I see. Thank you. Okay, so we have one other question in the chat from Ignat Fielkowski. Uh, am I right that none, almost, well, really Hamiltonians permit for analytical investigation? That they, well, I mean, you could, you could oh. argue that the, the, the continuum model is semi-analytical, right? I mean, you boil it down to, uh, you know, four by four matrix. And if you're good, I guess you can diagonalize analytically a four by four matrix. So, so yes, I mean, uh, you can work almost semi-analytically if you make, you know, assumptions of smoothness. Okay, so then we have another question from Ilya Eremin. Uh, you mentioned at the very begin beginning of the talk that Vanier functions appear to have an imaginary component, yet you have not commented on this during the talk. Could you come back to this? And does it mean that some symmetry is violated accidentally during downfolding? Okay, so this is a very good question. And it's basically, I mean, uh, as, as I said, uh, questions about uh, one year functions are most routinely swept under the rug. <laughs> so I'm grateful for this. And, and my honest answer is, I don't yet know. I mean, I, we don't yet understand it. So I, I, I work very closely with uh, Aras Mostofi on, on these topics, who is sort of one of the you know, if, if anybody in the world knows one year functions, it's him because he's the author of one year 90. And, and even he's confused. So, I mean, there, there are things we don't understand about these one functions. Um, Pierce mentioned this problem of, of topological obstruction. So there's uh, people uh, saying that in, uh, in principle, there should be problems with the construction of one year, of one year functions in these materials. Yet our group and, 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 and other groups have managed to construct one year functions. So, uh, so there's a lot of questions that, that are not fully answered yet. And, uh, and that, yeah, I think I just don't know what's going on myself. I would like to know. So would you think it's fair to say that it's an unbiased method to try and extract these tight binding Hamiltonians or is it actually more of an art than science still? Um, <laughs> um, well, developing tight binding models is always, is always tricky, right? Um, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's very widely used. So a lot of people do it and uh, the, the methods are fairly automated, but you always have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, I mean. Okay, good. So we had another question from Sam Carr. Sam, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, I was just, again, still curious about these tight binding models um, for a few reasons. Like, firstly, because of the size of the supercell, the energy scales are much, much lower. Um, and, I mean, of course, superconducting is a small temperature and everything, but we're just not used to materials um, with such small energy scales. So it would be very curious how disorder or anything else might play a role here. Um, and the other question was, again, because of the such small energy scales, how many bands end up being important if you try to start applying strongly correlated methods? Because it seems, again, that there's not this huge wide separation of scales. So it's all very well having your moiré scale type binding model. But if you need all 10,000 bands um, to actually do anything, then it's not clear what you can do. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that, that basically that, that relates to the last point is that should, should we think about other types of strong correlation methods where we don't need to do this downfolding? I mean, this downfolding is, I guess, I mean, from my point of view, it's, it's sort of a requirement because, um, you know, because I know that, you know, DMFT can only deal with a handful of orbitals. Um, so I, I, I need to, if, if I want to use these methods, uh, that, that are established in, in, in these sort of other fields, I need to downfold and I need to throw out some degrees of freedom. Uh, I have no choice because there's no other methods available, but you know, may, maybe that actually changes the physics and, and I completely agree with you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a major problem. And uh, also when you think about uh, sort of superconductivity, for example, um, one of the issues is that it can easily happen that the width of the flat bands is smaller than the relevant phonon energies. 
So you are in a very unconventional unconven regime, if, if you think it's phonon-mediated superconductivity. But it, it can very easily happen that you're in very unconventional regimes. And uh, you know, what, what a lot of people naturally do is they try to carry over what they've understood in one region to you know, this moiré material, but it's extremely error-prone. Yeah, okay. Could I just ask, also ask about your thoughts on disorder in this from both the, uh, I mean, are, do these materials have much disorder? You'd have thought 2D materials generally are relatively disordered compared to 3D ones. Um, so it might play a role and particularly given the small energy scales that might be important. But a second question is that um, if you look at literature from, for example, cold atoms community, one of the ways they add disorder is to add um, second lasers or something which are relatively incommensurate, giving very large supercells. And they say this is very much like because it's quite smooth on the atomistic level, um, which you would ex sort of expect from a very small angle in this twisted stuff. They sort of say, well, let's not think of it about a supercell, let's think about it in the original model, but with some disorder. And these ones don't seem to fit into that picture at all. And is there a clear classification of ones um, of things where a small angle might be considered as a disordered original lattice? Um, or is there a smooth way of going from this picture to the supercell picture or, or uh, okay, something else? I, I mean, you, you can think of the Moiré potential as a perturbation of your pure material. I mean, I think that's, that's a valid view of, of, of looking at it and uh, and um, but uh, well I mean I, I don't know much about disorder I think I think sort of people have still trouble understanding the pristine material so that's why um, so that this is still to come <laughs> thinking about defects and, and, and things like that but um, I mean to come to your first point I mean I guess it's always a point a, a question of reference point I mean for, for the people thinking about cuprates um, these graphene material materials are extremely clean, and, and and they are quite clean. I mean, and uh, sort of the uh, sort of the, the graphene itself can be made sort of monocrystalline with with very few defects. They sit on a very clean, atomically flat boron nitride substrate, and so what what people often think the main origin of defects are actually um, um, a charged impurities that sit in the substrate silicon underneath the boron nitride. So, so these defects are quite far removed from where the action is. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. That was a very detailed answer. So we have a question here next from uh, Chimiao Si, please. Um, I enjoy your talk. Um, yeah, so I, I think I have my question sort of has been asked uh, several times, but I just want to make sure that I understand the answers. In the tie binding fit, uh, description that you uh, went through, how many bands are there? Um, in, in the atomistic type binding? Uh, I thought you, you fit the Mori bands with the type binding, right? Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is a problem because there's two levels of type binding, right? So we start with the atomistic type binding, which has mm -hmm. as many orbitals as their atoms and uh, as right. many, you know. but then uh, basically when we, construct the Wanier functions, right? Uh, there will be as many bands as we have Wanier functions, right? And we have to make a choice how many Wanier functions we create or how many of the Bloch bands we choose to Wanierize. So the minimal number is four because your flat band manifold con contains uh, four bands, right? So, uh, and, and, and the flat band manifold is separated by all other bands with a band gap and so you know standard uh, one year function theory says if you have a, an isolated uh, manifold of bands you can you can one year rise that so so the lowest number is four uh, but then there's a big argument if you actually uh, shouldn't should take into account uh, if you want, should one year rise more bands to mm. get a more localized description but, but so, so you are using I just want to make sure I understand the counting of the bands so you are using the number of bands that is smaller than what the, the claim of topological obstruction uh, procedure uh, would imply, which uh, has a larger number of bands that, that must be involved according to that prescription. Well, I mean, so if I, I mean, the topological obstruction basically comes about when you start with the continuum model, is my impression, right? There is a, a problem when you look at 
the wave functions of the continuum model um, as a function of k throughout the Brion zone. Um, I don't think there's a problem in the tight binding because the tight binding uh, allows you to a degree to mix the different bands when you construct the one-year functions. And, and, and that's what we see, that our one-year functions are not purely valid, valid polarized in the tight binding. Which of course on, can only happen because you know in, in the type bind in the atomistic type binding there is no a priori valid, there is no built-in valley separation. Mm -hmm. But okay. but then again, people like Cushino have generated one-year functions from the continuum model, and and so I really don't know, uh, you know, what this claim of the topolog of the topological obstruction actually means in practice, because people still are able to generalize generate one small number of one-year functions from the continuum model. Okay, thank you. You're muted. Oh, right? Raised hand from Yashar Komijan, yes. I, I just unmuted myself, sorry. So uh, I guess I have a very naive question about this uh, when you're uh, uh, orbitals again. So uh, the experiments by the CM people like Yazlani or, uh, or others, they have shown that the density is located in the triangular lattices, right? So, uh, so when, when this uh, clover or, or fidgets uh, meet each other at the triangular lattice. So, so I guess my question is that what is the problem of having, I mean, if, if you could summarize, what is the problem of uh, uh, constructing a model based on the triangular lattice? And uh, the second question is that in the extreme mod phase, uh, uh, so I would expect that the electrons to be localized on, the, on, the, on this triangular lattice. So therefore, it, if, if uh, uh, if, if basically the, the, the orbital is divided by three, I mean, like one, one third of the electron is, is look at, located at each side of the stronger lattice, it's, it's not possible to pull this lattice apart. So, so as opposed to the normal mod phase, you cannot connect this smoothly to the vacuum. Okay, so that's, there is a, some topological uh, property there. Right? So can you comment a little bit around this, uh, uh, this, uh, this idea? Do you think that the, uh, that the, co uh, the correlations uh, uh, that are captured in DFT are, are uh, sufficient to, to describe this one-year function? Or, or if I increase the, the interaction, would this correlation uh, uh, lead to some sort of an effective, uh, effective uh, one-year function which would migrate from the center of the, the hexagonal lattice to the triangular lattice? Sorry for this long question. <laughs> no, no, this is uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so let, 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 me, let me try to answer this. So, so, the, so, the, so, so the, the answer to your first part is um, basically something that uh, Liang Fu has worked out. And he basically has shown, um, so using analytical arguments, that if you place the one year functions in the center of the AA regions as opposed to the AB regions, um, then you cannot uh, capture the. <laughs> my, my, my daughter's getting hungry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, when you, sorry. Uh, so when, when you place uh, the one year functions in, in the center of the AB regions, then you cannot capture the symmetries that you expect based on, you know, the material itself. So, so this is the work of, of, of Liang Fu, um, um, who, who basically has shown that. And your, your second question is also a good one. I mean, um, you know, do the one year functions themselves change if you take into account and would you construct other one year functions if you had taken account into account interactions? And uh, I'm wondering that myself. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. And, and that also has to do with sort of this downfolding on, on to a, a few degrees of freedom. So I, 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 uh, it's, it's, I, I don't know. One year functions you can argue forever, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid we can't because we have <laughs> out of time. However, uh, there's one last question by Bruno Tomazzolo, who, whom I invite to, to finish off the session with his question. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks for the very nice uh, pedagogical talk. It was quite clear to me also if uh, I don't work on uh, twisted bilayer systems. I was curious actually about this, uh, this feature, which I had not understand, understood in the past, about the fact that there is this sort of modulation that you're showing actually in your last slide. So I, was, I want to understand if uh, when you talk about systems that are quite clean, it's also about the fact that this modulation is actually as regular as we may deduce from uh, this picture you're giving. If, 
you're asking how, how realistic this picture is in the real material? Yes. Uh, so first of all, uh, this, this picture is slightly exaggerated. So we've, <laughs> so, uh, we've blown up the, the, the corrugation for, for visualization yes. purposes. And uh, I mean, the other, uh, I mean, this is, is a difficult question. I mean, uh, basically, I mean, what, what everybody has done so far, they have modeled a twisted bilayer graphene in vacuum, right? Of course, in an experiment, there's, it's never in vacuum, it sits, it's encapsulated. And the uh, question is, you know, um, what, what's the effect? I mean, ob obviously the encapsulation will sort of squeeze it back into a more flat state. Um, now, uh, uh, we, we think uh, it, it must be corrugated to a degree, and that's because if you don't take corrugation into account, the flat, there's no gap between the flat bands and the higher and lower energy gaps. So we think, we think there's st a strong uh, reason why they must be corrugated to some degree, uh, but how much it actually is, uh, is very hard to tell. I mean, you, you might think um, STM could give you an indication uh, because, you know, if you come in with a tip, but unfortunately STM, it's because the electrons also localize, it's very hard to, to sort of disentangle the electronic signal from the atomic structure signal. So I don't know if anybody has ever sort of verified, you know, for example, how high the peaks are and how low the troughs. Mm -hmm. But did I understand correctly that your empirical tight binding uh, Hamiltonian is, re needs this requirement? The fact that there needs to be these regions that are closer and others that are further away. I mean, no, you can do the tight binding for the flat material too, right? I mean, you, you can do okay. the tight binding for the flat material. It's not a requirement. No, but I meant like in terms of the overlapped orbitals that you were showing in this, uh, this later coastal rules. Yes, yeah, so these, I mean, obviously, you know, this corrugation will have an important effect on sort of the, 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 the hopping from one layer to the other layer, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's why, you know, you might think this, this could be quite important to get the atomic structure right because, you know, this whole thing comes from interlayer hopping is, is what, what gives rise to these uh, interesting band structures. All right, thanks all. Hey, brilliant. So that brings us then formally to the end of our session, uh, unless Pierre still wanted to clarify the point that was kind of touched upon by Yashar. Um, well, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I think two points came up here, which were very interesting. Um, one is that, of course, these are very, very expanded systems. And in some sense, if you think about it, each electron is trapped inside the hexagon. It's bouncing backwards and forwards across the AA regions. And, uh, and so you can think of them sort of like huge quantum dots. And the, and the paradox that, that Yashar was alluding to is the paradox that the Vanier centers are on the uh, hexagonal sites, but the charge buildup is, uh, seems to be on the triangular sites. And this prevents, leads to a fascinating dichotomy that I don't think we've really gotten to the bottom, bottom of, but presumably in the Mott phase, the charge and the spin is trapped inside the hexagons. Uh, uh, whereas uh, in the band structure, the Vanier states are uh, located uh, these rigid spinners located on the hexagonal lattice. And I think this is a central issue that the field needs to get to grips with. Um, uh, but I think Yashar already raised that. That was my only point. Excellent. And so uh, we're now going to uh, 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 transition into the uh, student-led uh, discussions. Uh, and I will make um, our host for today's, uh, today's um, uh, student -led discussions the host. Let me just see, today it's Monday and it's uh, Mikolic uh, Urziek. And if you can uh, unmute so I can locate you up. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here. So in a few minutes I'll make you, I'll make you the host. Um, okay, it's fun.